It is good to be with you again. I bring warm greetings from Bright Divinity School on behalf of our president, Newell Williams, the dean, Jaretta Marshall, the faculty, staff, and student body, some of whom are a part of your scandalous conspiracy, which you call church. Speaking of Bright Divinity School, your pastor, Reverend Dr. Katie Hayes, and several of you co-conspirators were on campus a couple weeks ago for community conversation. It is not a stretch of the biblical metaphor or text to say that you brought a bit of new wine with you, an obscured flask to campus, a violation of the rules, by the way. As a result of said new wine, the safe, secure, hallowed, and might I add, accredited wine skin of institutional life seems to have sprung a new leak, so to speak. Wine is starting to flow in new ways, and our imaginations are thinking anew about churches, neighborhoods, bars, social media, and, well, institutions, too. Truth be told, there is nothing scandalous about wine and wineskins. It's rather business as usual and status quo. And where things are status quo, there is no scandal. And where there is no scandal, there is no gospel. And where there is no gospel, there is no cross. And where there is no cross, there is no liberation. But new wine? It's a scandal in the making. Will you pray with me? God of grape and vineyard, send us new wine so that we are liberated to participate in the scandal of your gospel to which you have called us all. For to be called to the scandal of your gospel and not participate in it is all a scandal. Cleanse our palates, O God, so that we may taste and see and know. We pray and ask this in the name of your beloved. Amen. Scandal! Scandal! Hear all about it, cries the author of Mark. Jesus calls Levi. Now this I have got to hear, says the gospeler's early audience. A crowd gathers to hear, and the storyteller primes her lips. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. Gasp goes the crowd. Say it ain't so, cries one woman. Levi, Levi. One says as he fishes in his pockets to rub together those shekels that are no longer there. Everyone else seems to join in that onomatopoeic hissing S sound at the mere mention of Levi, employee par excellence of King Herod. The hearers were no doubt familiar with the tax practices of Levi, the only person to whom the narrator gives a proper name in the scandalous stories that we hear today. When pulling up to the border patrol agent to declare one's goods, one prayed not to see the name Levi embroidered on the uniform of the officer. A wolf of Wall Street in his own time and place, Levi's reputation as a customs officer clearly preceded him, and he was despised as little better than a thief or swindler. Since toll collectors determine what price persons bringing goods across the boundary must pay, a toll collector might, shall we say, enrich himself by demanding more than the required amount. As long as the toll collector was able to cover cover the tax revenue promised in his contract with the authorities, he could keep whatever was left for himself. Not a bad business, you know. Without objection and with no spoken dialogue from Levi himself, the narrator continues her story, telling us that Levi got up and followed Jesus. 
the headline and the lead of the story have hooked the hearers, the plot thickens and the scandal intensifies as the narrator continues saying, And as he reclined at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now the hearers thrust their right hands to their hearts in personified pain. They can hardly handle this story. The scandal is just too much. Levi was bad enough, but now many tax collectors and sinners? What is this? A staff party? A gathering of the 1% and the first century equivalent of the Mira Vista Country Club to brag about the inflated tariffs and imported goods? To add insult to injury here, Jesus is there, and not just there, but eating. And not just eating, but drinking. And not just drinking, but reclining on a couch. And not just reclining on a couch, but shooting the bull with these newly called followers. As the narrator works the crowd, the hearer's anticipation begins to rise with each step of her dramatic delivery. Yet she knows the real scandal has yet to be revealed. Finally, the Pharisees enter the picture, and they ask the question that has been forming in the gathered crowd's minds, and our minds too. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? The hearing crowd, they erupt in applause. Finally, the good guys, and it's always guys, by the way, are on the scene. We may applaud them too at the hearing of the Pharisees' question, because it is awfully perspective perplexing that Jesus is whining, dining, and reclining with the rich and infamous. There is no call to repent. There is no call to sell everything and give to the poor. And there is no lesson from Jesus on not oppressing the least of these. The narrator's crowd is now eating out of her hands as they wait with bated breath to hear the reply that Jesus gives, even as she knows that scandal is still yet to come. The narrator shifts her posture, the moves skilled storytellers use to indicate that a new character is speaking. Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I have come to call not the just, but sinners. The hearers had thought the scandal was the calling of Levi, the whining and the dining and the reclining with the tax collectors and sinners. But they can never have seen this scandal coming, not in a million years. Being just, being right with God and neighbor is not a prerequisite to dine with Jesus. But you can bet that being just and being right with God and neighbor is always a result of having dined with Jesus. It's a scandal, the narrator assures her hearers. Scandal! Scandal! Hear all about it, calls the author of Mark. Jesus' disciples ignore the fast. The narrator has upped the ante, so to speak, and a larger crowd settles in for yet another shocking saga. She breathes from her gut, the very source of her breath, and says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Good question, one interjects in the middle of the story. I haven't eaten for two days, says one pious man. What happens next, Ask one, clearly on pins and needles. She gives a suspicious smile, turns again, shifting to Jesus' character, and delivers the riddle. The wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? No, shouts the narrator's crowd in reply. She continues. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch will, will pull away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. 
Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. Well, of course no one sews new cloth on old cloth, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Everybody knows that. The crowd clamors amongst themselves and shouts back to the narrator, there's no scandal here. While these familiar logical expressions ring true in our ears, there is a scandal brewing in the midst of a wedding. Everyone loves a good wedding, especially the Hebrew prophets, who often used wedding imagery to express the joy that is a part of God's coming realm. The bridegroom for this wedding feast is none other than Jesus himself. He is on the scene, and he is the center of attention. The scandal is out. The bridegroom is here, and it is Jesus. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. Well, it may not be tomorrow, but... The bridegroom seems to know that he will not always be on the scene. We get a sneak peek at the gospel the narrator is developing. Jesus is God's agent. Jesus seems to be saying that God is doing something new. And this new cloth, this new wine, this new lifestyle will eventually overturn the vicious cycle of prejudiced human systems and exploitative empires. It's a scandal, the narrator assures her hearers. Scandal! Scandal! Hear all about it, calls out the author of Mark. Disciples pluck grain on the Sabbath. Tell the truth and shame the devil, cries one hearer. Another says, come on, come on, preacher. And another person hollers out over the rest just saying, well, well, with long-felt expectation." The narrator continues, the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? This time nobody said anything. The question was good. The bait was set. The hearers are ready for the scandal. The narrator turns again to switch characters, giving voice to Jesus. Have you ever read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest, and he ate the bread of presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and he gave some to his companions. No doubt the narrator's narrator's hearers began scratching their heads, and we might be doing the same thing thinking of 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 7. On first hearing, there is very little parallel from this instance with the disciples to David. However, the the narrator knows what she is doing be it bread or be it Sabbath, things consecrated to God are not absolute values in and of themselves, but they exist for your sake and for mine. She adds Jesus' final statement. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is even Lord of the Sabbath. Did you hear it? Did you hear the scandal? The Sabbath was made is a divine passive construct. The Sabbath was made by God for you and for me and not the other way around. We were not made to fulfill the Sabbath. Rather, the Sabbath was made by God for us. The Sabbath is God's gift. That's not all. The Son of Man, the one who has already had authority on earth to forgive sin, is also Lord of the Sabbath. It's a scandal, the narrator assures her hearers. Scandal! Scandal! Hear all about it! Calls out the author of Mark. Jesus heals man with withered hand, on Sabbath in synagogue. 
True to form, the narrator saves her very best scandal for last. This one is, is just too salacious, too spicy, too shocking, too shady, too, too, too sensational, too startling, too surprising, and too, well, scandalous. If you're not rubbing your hands together in eager anticipation, you're missing the scandal. He entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. The narrator packs so much into this statement, she pauses to catch her breath. Jesus is in the synagogue, a new location, and there is a man with a withered hand. If you're not thinking Leviticus 21, you should be. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near. One who is blind or lame or one who has a mutilated face or limb too long or one who has a broken foot or a broken hand. That one shall not draw near. Some may be wondering how he got into the synagogue in the first place. And since nobody but Jesus says a word in this story, the silence is deafening and evidence that an ulterior plot is at work. The narrator continues her story. She hunkers down low, saying they watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they may accuse him. And he said to the man with a withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? Silence. Not a word. Not even the crickets lurking in the corners dared to chirp. The anonymous man with a withered hand has not even made a request for healing. Jesus looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at the hardness of heart, and he said to the man, You stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Without doing a bit of work, Jesus heals the man on the Sabbath and in the synagogue. He fulfills the law even as he indicts those who are preparing, who are preparing to do evil and to kill. It's a scandal, the narrator assures her hearers. Scandal! Scandal! Hear all about it. Call out the co-conspirators of Galileo Church. Mansfield Church welcomes queers. Mansfield Church members drink beer while reading the Bible. Mansfield Church has female pastor. Mansfield Church named for heretical astronomer. Mansfield Church doesn't have a building. Or Mansfield Church has wine tasting. Take your pick, as there seems to be no shortage of scandals in this gospel-proclaiming church. This is a scandal I've got to see, say many. And others may say the scandal is too good to be true. Still others may deny that the scandal even exists. The scandal proclaimed here is one that makes us just having had wine with Jesus. The scandal we embody here is one in which we celebrate the presence of God with feast of bread and wine. The scandal experienced here is one in which we find a Sabbath rest. The scandal to which we give our full selves is one in which we find healing. And yes, yes, there are those, even in our own Christian communities, who may try to put the kibosh on the scandal. But where there is a scandal, there is gospel. And where there is gospel, there is the cross. And where there is cross, there is liberation. And where there's liberation, well, that'll turn the world upside down.
It's a scandal, I assure you. What do you call such a scandal? I call it new wine. 